we're grown-ups. We're tall and smart and know things about life. We're also writers. So doesn't it make sense that one of our jobs should be to teach our readers, who are often shorter and with a lot less life experience, what we know? And shouldn't these readers be grateful for the wisdom that we want to share? If you've ever started a conversation with a child or teenager by saying, let me give you some advice, you know that these words are their cue to roll their eyes and tune you out. If a book, especially a work of fiction, smacks of advice giving, it's all over. You've lost your audience. I'm not saying you can't imbue your story with messages or life lessons, but if you want your readers to listen, you have to go about it the right way. One of my favorite quotes on writing is from Mark Haddon, the author of the best-selling novel, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. He said, remove yourself from the picture. Put yourself completely at the disposal of your characters, your situations, your story. Don't give in to the temptation to show off or to indulge yourself. No one is reading the book to find out about you. Quite the opposite. A good book will help the readers find out more about themselves. What? No one is reading the book to find out about you? But you're the writer. Yeah, not so much. There's nothing wrong with working a message or life lesson into your story. Many of the best books do just that, but they do it in a way that doesn't preach to the reader. Let's take a look at a few books that got it right. The Mixed Up Chameleon by Eric Carle. I have critiqued a lot of picture book manuscripts that have the theme, you are special just the way you are. It's a good theme and deserves to be revisited, but you have to present it in a way that makes sense to the youngest children. Eric Carle does this with humor and brilliantly colorful artwork. The chameleon has a quiet life. When he's cold, he turns dull and gray. When he's warm, he becomes sparkling green. And the rest of the time, he's the color of whatever he's crawling on. And he eats flies. That's about it. Then one day he goes to the zoo and sees all kinds of extraordinary animals who can do things he can't do. And suddenly he wants to be just like them. His wish is granted, and piece by piece, he acquires parts of the other animals he admires until he's a jumbled, mixed-up mess. All this changing has made him hungry, but when a fly goes by, he can no longer catch it. Suddenly, he realizes that he preferred to be just the way he was, and he changes back. It's a simple story, but it makes his point beautifully because the message doesn't overshadow the plot. It doesn't confuse its young audience with explanations or unnecessary details. And that's why even preschoolers get it. Wilfred Gordon MacDonald Partridge by Mem Fox, illustrated by Julie Vivas. One mistake I see a lot is authors who are writing for the picture book audience and introducing abstract concepts in an abstract way. These kids think in concrete, literal terms, and that's how you have to reach them. In Men Fox's exquisite book, Wilfred Gordon is a small boy who lives next door to an old people's home and is friends with all the people who live there. One day he finds out that his favorite friend, Miss Nancy, is losing her memory. Wilfred is confused. He doesn't know what a memory is. He calls on each of the old people and, in their gentle, loving wisdom, they show him exactly what memories are made of. Armed with his new knowledge, Wilfred is now able to help Miss Nancy find what she's lost. Mem Fox's clear, rhythmic prose, Julie Vivas's glowing, round, huggable people, and a no-nonsense, childlike approach to a rather grown-up problem makes this story and its message of friendship, compassion, and cherishing our memories very accessible to the picture book reader. Amanda Pig and Her Big Brother Oliver by Jean Van Leeuwen, illustrated by Anne Swinegar. 
Kids in first and second grade are in that phase of life when they're transitioning from little kid to big kid and all the expectations that come with it. They're also still often told that they're too young or too small to do many of the things they want. And they sometimes have younger siblings who follow them everywhere. Added to this is their parents' expectation that these kids are becoming old enough to start considering the other person's point of view and feelings. That's a lot to absorb at a time when they're also learning to read on their own. What Jean Van Leeuwen does in all her easy readers about Amanda and Oliver Pig is show this time of life with small vignettes of family and school interactions. In Amanda Pig and her big brother Oliver, we get five short chapters that portray both Oliver's frustration with having Amanda tag along and his evolution to embracing his role as big brother and Amanda's discovery that she can do things on her own. The reader sees both viewpoints and gains a bit of understanding how the other person feels, all in simple text that beginning readers can handle all by themselves. Wonder by R. J. Palacio. Once kids are middle graders, they have the ability to empathize and feel great compassion, but they're also ruled mightily by the desire to fit in and get the approval of their peers. Middle school is looming on the horizon, and these kids are starting to construct the armor necessary to get through it. Wonder is a story about a boy with no armor whatsoever. August Pullman was born with a facial deformity that, up until now, has prevented him from going to a mainstream school. Starting fifth grade at Beecher Prep, he wants nothing more than to be treated as an ordinary kid, but his new classmates can't get past Augie's extraordinary face. The book starts out in Augie's viewpoint, but then alternates between his high school sister, her boyfriend, his classmates, and other characters. The author does not sugarcoat any of the treatment Augie gets, nor the feelings of the other characters. We see students at Augie's school washing their hands after they accidentally touch him. We're with Augie when he overhears the boy he considered his best friend say he'd kill himself if he looked like Augie. We feel his sister's embarrassment when Augie wants to visit her at her new high school where, for the first time in her life, she's not known as the girl with the freak brother. And then we also feel her shame for having such disloyal thoughts. And we truly understand the courage it takes at times to simply be a friend. This isn't just Augie's struggle. It's a struggle for his family, his classmates, and his community. R.J. Palacio has called her first novel a meditation on kindness. And I love that. It's not a lesson or a speech or a plot proclamation. It's a meditation. It presents the struggle of the characters from all sides with no judgment. But I guarantee that every reader is inspired to rise up and practice kindness after finishing this book. Eleanor and Park by Rainbow Roll. As adults, we can give our teens all kinds of insight into the nature of love. We can say it's more than infatuation, that it doesn't force you to change who you are, but it allows you to become who you are, that it can make you exquisitely happy and unbearably sad, and that if you have to put the other person's welfare and safety above what you want, you'll do it in a heartbeat. But until teens live through this themselves, they'll never believe we know what we're talking about. Eleanor and Park is the closest thing I've ever read to actually being in love. We absolutely believe that these two outsiders found each other and became better together. We see every nuance of their attraction, and we understand that love embraces color and shape and personal history and doesn't care what other people think. Like all great love stories, Eleanor and Park is also tragic. Because they're still teenagers, the characters don't have absolute control over the twists their lives take. But the author has given us enough room at the end to hope that somewhere Eleanor and Park are still together. This book touched adults as much as teens, garnering all kinds of glowing reviews. 
and it inspired fans to post incredible artwork online. Teens respect an author who can bear her soul. If you want to see how that's done, read this book. These books, along with many others, offer terrific examples of how to avoid preaching to your readers. If you're a member of Children's Book Insider, head on over to the CBI Clubhouse to see my bonus article, Five Ways to Show, Not Preach in Your Own Writing, along with another very personal book example. If you're not a member, go to cbiclubhouse.com and sign up. You'll have access to lots of bonus articles, videos, and podcasts on all aspects of writing, publishing, and marketing your books, ebooks, and apps. See you at the clubhouse.